The nuclear family is not the center of God's kingdom. The family unit may be the building block of our society, and it should be. God created it that way in creation. He ordered it that way. But the nuclear family, while critical to our civilization, is not the center of God's kingdom. Again, that is not to say it's not important, just that it's not ultimate in the kingdom of God. Okay, single people, tell me if you have ever experienced this. Have you ever felt like the world tells you that you're missing out on something because, because you're not married? You know, even in the church, we often equate marriage with some sort of completion. Like you're, you're only living your best life if you've got a spouse and family at home. Well, while marriage can, of course, be, be awesome, thankfully, Jesus taught something altogether different and more beautiful when it comes to, to our relationship status. Today, we're gonna look at how Jesus' death and resurrection actually created a forever family, a family that, that trumps even the nuclear biological family unit as the center of God's kingdom. Regardless of what your relationships look like right now, there is something here for you today. So grab your Bible and let's see what God's word has to say to all of us. I, I think you'll be encouraged. If you got your Bible with you this weekend, if you'll take it out and open it to Matthew 19, where we left off last weekend. Last weekend, we began a series on marriage, and I know some of you eagerly brought your spouse with you back to church this week, just excited for me to tell them everything you've been trying to tell them for years. Uh, or maybe you came back because you were ready to get some instructions, some good instructions on dating and being able to find the one. Today, as we kind of get rolling into this series, we're gonna talk about singleness. Now, I know you say, well, why in a series on marriage and relationships, we're going to talk about singleness first off? Well, first, very obvious reason, about 6,000 of you listening to me this weekend at one of our campuses are single. That's right. There are more than 6,000 single people in our church. In fact, let's just see at every campus right now. If you are married, why don't you raise your hand? Raise your hand if you're married. Just hold it up. Raise it up high there. All right, okay, put it down. How many of you are not married? Why don't you raise your hand up, if you will, okay? All right, put your hands down. How many of you are single and would really be open, really be open to meeting the one sometime soon? Why don't you raise your hand, okay? By the way, hold your hand up, hold it up. All right, everybody kind of scan the room, look around if your hand's up. Uh, just kidding, don't do that, okay? That's not what this is about. How about this one? How many of you, how many of you met and married the one, but now after a few years, you'd like to trade in the one for another one. Why don't you, no, do not raise your hand. That's just a joke, okay? <laughs> yes, sir, I see that hand. God bless you, sir. I see that. I'll pray for you. Did you know, did you know this generation in American history will remain single longer than any previous generation in human history? The average age for uh, an American uh, getting married is now 30 years old for a male and about 28 years old for the woman, which is the highest that it's ever been as far as we know. By the time today's middle schoolers reach 50 years of age, one in four of them will have been single for their entire life. Uh, my family and I, at one point, um, had a college girl here from the Summit Church uh, live with us for an extended amount of time. And she told us, she said, you know, it can be really tough to be single at the Summit Church, at a church like the Summit Church. First, she said, everybody is constantly pressuring you to get married like something's wrong. Uh, second, she said, when you do notice somebody in church that, you know, you're pretty sure was checking you out and you were kind of checking them out too, uh, she said, all of a sudden, you really get self-conscious about everything. She said, for example, like, how do you worship? Do you go, you know, full on Pentecostal, hands in the air, washing heaven's windows, or is that gonna be just a little bit too much? Maybe you should go with the, you know, the underarm, charismatic, carry the TV, I just wanna receive from the Lord posture. Maybe that's less intimidating. She says, when, and when you, you know, when, when, when you stand up and start the sermon, you know you gotta reach for an actual paper Bible, because there's no way if you pull out your Bible on your phone that you take God seriously at all, right? Did I say it? Yeah, I said it, okay. But she said, you gotta reach for that paper Bible, to show that you're a serious uh, follower of Jesus. She said, and then she said, oh, she said, then I sometimes worship and I got to make sure I hold up my left hand. That way they can see there's no ring on it. Uh, she said, that's a consideration. 
Um, uh, then at the end, uh, I forgot about that one, but in between two of the services, she came up and said, you forgot about this thing, about holding up your left hand. Um, then she said at the end, she said, then there's the, when the come forward for prayer, she's like, should you go forward for prayer to show that you're broken and humble and, and you, you know, need any prayer? Or does that just make it look like you have issues? Uh, she said, so I don't really know what to do. I said, why don't you just come forward and pretend you're on the prayer team and then it will look like that you, you know, are, are, are in the ministry team. So anyway, so much pressure, right? So much pressure to think about. So anyway, the reason that I'm starting with singleness is that we have so many singles at this church. More importantly though, um, the reason we're starting with it is because Jesus's entire approach to marriage is grounded in a concept that redefines not only marriage and everything attached to it, it also redefines singleness, which is why in Matthew 19, we saw last weekend that Jesus took a question about divorce, and in his answer, he wove a teaching on singleness into it. Matthew 19, that's where we left off last week, after teaching that marriage was beautiful, and it was a reflection of God's plan and a reflection of who God is. And after explaining that not only was it beautiful, it's really, really difficult. And if you're gonna survive in it and thrive in it, it's gonna take God's help. Then Jesus turns and says this, verse 12, four, there are also eunuchs. If you remember a eunuch is somebody whose re normal reproductive organs um, have been damaged or, 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 or they're not formed correctly. He said there are some eunuchs who have been so from birth and I told you that, that almost all commentators agree that eunuch here is a metaphor. Not only does it refer to an actual eunuch, but it's a metaphor for people who aren't married. Um, he said there are some who have been so from birth. Maybe that means because they are intersex, or maybe it's because they are, don't have normal sexual desires that would lead them to get married in, in the way that God prescribes. There are some who have been made eunuchs by men. Uh, that would mean, you know, literally, it would mean uh, somebody who is a slave or a political prisoner, but metaphorically, what that would mean is they might want to get married, but for whatever reason, the circumstances of life haven't led that. They would choose it if they could, but they, they don't seem to be able to at this point. Maybe they haven't found the right person or there's some situation that precludes them from getting married. Lastly, Jesus says, there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That's those people who have chosen singleness because of something they feel like God has called them to at some point in their life. And Jesus said, there are people who are eunuchs for one of those three reasons and let the one who is able to receive this let them receive it. Let them receive it. Here's what's radical in what Jesus is saying. When Jesus brings this up, everybody that was listening to him, all the Jewish people, knew that he was referring to Isaiah 56, which was a beautiful Old Testament passage in which eunuchs are promised in the coming of the Messiah, eunuchs were promised an inheritance that was better than the inheritance of sons and daughters. You see, in Isaiah's day, in prophet Isaiah's day, about 800, year, 800 years before Jesus, singles were considered to be missing an essential part of a happy, blessed life. Not only were they without a life partner, without a companion, they were also being unable to have kids, and that meant that kids, because kids guaranteed your inheritance of the people of God, it meant that in many ways they were cut off from what they thought was a spiritual heritage. So many people regarded eunuchs to be cursed. Isaiah 56 prophesies, though, that in the coming kingdom of the Messiah, that all that's going to be overturned and the eunuch is going to be blessed right alongside the married, equally to the married, because in the Messiah, the eunuch will be given an eternal inheritance that is independent of children or family. The eunuch may lack physical family, but he or she is woven into God's forever family. In the Messiah, Jesus is saying, all curse is removed and singleness is no longer a stigma. That's what's radical about what he says there in that verse. I wanna use this idea from Isaiah 56 that Jesus quotes. I wanna use that to deal with a deeply held myth in our culture. One not only believed and propagated by our culture, but sadly, one that we promote all too often in our churches also. It is what I would call the marriage equals completion myth. This myth assumes that marriage in a nuclear family is some kind of ultimate state for mankind. And thus, if you don't find the special someone to spend your life with, well, then you have missed out on the essential part of a full and happy life. You can hear the overtones of this myth in how we in a church like this one often try to encourage or console someone who is single. 
we will say, well, don't worry. You know, you're going to get married someday. As if we are saying, poor you. I know it must be hard to miss such an essential part of a happy life. Dr. Bruce Ashford, who was one of our elders here at the Summit Church, and uh, he's about my age, and he was uh, vice president, pro, or he is vice president, provost of Southeastern Seminary for many years at this church, was single. And uh, Bruce used to say, he said, I know they mean well, but he said, I just got so tired of being these. Every time I was at a wedding or at the Summit Church, these sweet little old ladies would come up and they'd elbow me. They'd be like, don't worry, Bruce, you'll be next. He's like, I just got so tired of it. I started to pay him back at funerals. I would go to them and I'd elbow them. like, don't worry, you're next. He said, I just was tired of it. But I said, you have a hateful spirit and we need to pray for you and maybe cast out a demon. But um, anyway, uh, or sometimes we'll tell singles, God has just a little, God just has a little bit of work left to do on you before he brings you that special someone. That's why you're waiting. You know, you gotta become someone special before God can give you someone special. And the single person is left to think like, wait, I'm not special or I'm not lovable yet. That's not to mention the truly dysfunctional people I see who get married. And I'm like, look, if marriage was some kind of reward to those who had, had become special and, and lovable, I feel like God got the wrong address on that couple. Am I right? Everybody point at somebody and say, amen. No, no, I'm kidding. Don't point at somebody, but say amen. A lot of churches treat their singles ministries as little more than sanctified substitutes for singles bars as a, a way to try to fix what is a problem. In fact, I know of one church, and I'm not making this up. I know of one church that called its adult social group pairs and spares. So the single people are the spares. The assumption is that marriage is the only way to live a full and happy life. Now I realize we can all in here kind of laugh about stories like that, but that myth, it leads to a lot of confusion and pain. And Jesus, who was single himself, taught explicitly against this myth. In fact, he taught against it so strongly that if you didn't know better, you'd be tempted to think that Jesus was dissing on marriage altogether. One of the most important questions in life is this, what exactly is the gospel? Is it a set of rules to follow? A lifestyle to uphold? This is something we have to get right. Scripture tells us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. Religion keeps telling us that we need extra layers, but but that's just not true. Religion says be and and do it a certain way to be accepted, but, but that's not true either. The truth is that you are loved so deeply and accepted so fully in Christ that all you should be experiencing in Him is freedom. Freedom from yourself, freedom from your sin, and freedom from the pressure to do or to act a certain way to to earn anything. This is the good news of the gospel, a relationship with God. And this, this truth is what we hope that you will embrace and enjoy for the rest of your life and your eternity. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, We'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The Gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you on a little gospel tour. You can stay there in Matthew 19 because we're gonna end up pulling the bus right back into that station. So you can hang out there and I'll catch back up to you in a moment. But I wanna take you through a little gospel tour for a few minutes because I wanna show you every place that Jesus taught this and show you how he developed this theme. All right, so Matthew 19, I'm gonna head over to Mark 3 for a moment. Mark 3, we're still in the marriage's completion myth. Uh, Mark chapter three, and his mother and his brothers came By the way, stop there for a minute, just a little Bible trivia. For those of you that were raised in a church that taught that Mary was a perpetual virgin and that she didn't have any other kids, you need to look no further in this verse right here to know that's not true. Jesus had brothers. Uh, Mary and Joseph had other kids, and so they would have been Jesus' half-brothers, and uh, he had a family. 
All right, so his mother and his brothers come. They need to have some kind of family meeting, I don't know, to discuss something. Uh, and they were standing outside and they called over to Jesus. And a crowd was sitting around Jesus and the crowd said to him, hey, Jesus, your mom and your brothers, they're outside and they are seeking you. And Jesus answered them in response, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and she is my sister and she is my mother. Now question, what is going on here? Does Jesus not love his mom? Did he not love his biological brothers? Does he not identify with them and feel like he is a part of their family? Of course he did. He is simply using this opportunity to teach something very important. And that is he had a family, listen to this, more important to him than even his biological one. In his death and resurrection, he was creating a forever family that would trump even the bonds of biology. This is a radical idea. And one, chances are you probably haven't heard a lot in church. The nuclear family is not the center of God's kingdom. The family unit may be the building block of our society, and it should be. God created it that way in creation. He ordered it that way. But the nuclear family, while critical to our civilization, is not the center of God's kingdom. Again, that is not to say it's not important, just that it's not ultimate in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, yeah, my mom and my my brothers, that's great. But you wanna know who my forever family is, it's people who trust in me and are obeying my word. Luke 11 is where I'll go next. As Jesus was saying these things, he's teaching some truth. A woman in the crowd calls out to Jesus, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nurse. Now, let me just go ahead and stop here for a minute and say, I love it when people talk back to me when I preach. Preach it, preacher. All right, I'm gonna go ahead on record and say, that's gotta be the weirdest thing ever said to somebody when they were preaching, am I right? right? Blessed Jesus are the breast at which you nurse. And Jesus turned around to her and said, gross. No, no, uh, he said, he looked at, at, back at her and said, blessed, no, rather are those who hear, who hear the word of God and keep it. Take a minute and let that sink in. Somebody basically said, Jesus, how awesome it must be to be related to you. And Jesus' response is, nope. Those who obey the word of God are more blessed and precious to Jesus than even his own biological mom. I mean, just think about it for a minute. How awesome would it be to have Jesus in your ancestry tree? You know, you order 23 of me and that comes back. All right, we're gonna have some theological problems if that does. But if that came back, okay, how I'd be working that into any conversation I could, right? Well, you know, my ancestor, Jesus, I think you've heard of him. Uh, you know, I would, I would talk about that all the time. The Jesus is like, well, it's not that big of a deal. If you were bio- happened to be biologically related, related to me, if you were the son, great, great, great grandson of one of my half brothers, that's not a big deal. If you were even my mom, that's not a big deal. But if you were united to me by baptism and have my spirit dwelling in you, that's a huge deal. Christopher Yuan, who is a Christian author, I really respect, writes a lot about same-sex attraction because it's something that he's dealt with throughout his life. He is single. He says, and I quote, our earthly families are temporarily bound by blood, but the family of God is eternally bound by the blood of the lamb. And that's a stronger bind. Mark chapter 12 is where we'll go next. And the Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, which is why they are Sadducee. Okay, you've been in Sunday school. Ask Jesus a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. I know that's a little weird, but that's what it was in the Old Testament, okay? That was a law. Well, there once was a man who had seven brothers. The first took a wife, or once there were seven brothers total. The first took a wife, and when he died, He left no offspring. So the second took her and he died, also leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven all left no offspring. Okay, so all seven married this woman and none of them have kids with her, which by the time you're like number five, I'm like, that's enough. Okay, I'm not gonna be number five because there's obviously a um, thing happening here. Um, Seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. You're like, this sounds like the prologue to a, a Mormon joke. It's not, okay, this is a real question. In the resurrection, when they rise again, 
whose wife will she be? Because the seven had her as wife. The Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. They're trying to ridicule Jesus for believing in a resurrection. And this is their test question. <laughs> He's got seven, you know, this woman's got seven husbands. Whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? Jesus, you idiot. All right, again, I told you, never play Bible trivia with Jesus. Jesus' response is to say, you were wrong, not just in the way you think, you're wrong on the whole question. Because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. For when we, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're like the angels in heaven. Jesus' answer, very simply, in heaven, marriage and the nuclear family do not exist. We saw that last weekend, according to Jesus in the Garden of Eden, marriage was God's plan A for dealing with our loneliness. God looked at man and said, it's not good that man should be alone. And his plan A to deal with that was to create the first marriage. I told you that, that, that loneliness is the one ache that we have that does not come from sin. God created us in a perfect state to still desire human companionship. In heaven, there will be no marriage or biological family. And that is not to say that we will there in heaven have lost our need for companionship or to say that it's okay for us to be lonely up there. It's simply that God will deal with our loneliness in a new and better way. It's, and marriage is no longer gonna be his plan A for dealing with that loneliness. And so that means whoever we are married to down here, we're not gonna be married to them up there. In fact, we won't be married at all. Now I will admit to you freely, okay? Part of me finds that a little sad. Well, in heaven, when I see Veronica, there's not gonna be anything. Like, well, I at least be able to give her, you know, kind of a, a wink and a, and a suggestive nod, right? You say, no? Well, I don't know, I mean, I don't know about that. That's probably getting too detailed, but you're like, well, that makes me sad too. Well, there's no sadness, of course, in heaven. And that's because in heaven, you see, our joys, we know this, are not diminished at all. Nobody's in heaven feel like they're missing out on anything. Our joys in heaven are not diminished. Listen, they're heightened. They're transformed. They're matured. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Miracles, had a great example for this. He said, a toddler, a toddler thinks that the single greatest pleasure in life is candy, right? So imagine you're a grandmother trying to explain to your toddler granddaughter some of the things you most love about life. Staring out at the beauty of the Grand Canyon, reading a good book, falling in love and getting married, watching one of your kids graduate. And as you're trying to explain this to your toddler granddaughter, she looks back at you and says, yeah, but, but can you eat Skittles while you do those things? You've got a hard time explaining to her that these pleasures that you're describing are so much better than eating candy. So much so that when you're wrapped up in one of those pleasures, you're not even going to think about Skittles. C.S. Lewis said that we, like that little child, lack the ability to understand the joys of eternity. What we know now are the pleasures of earthly things like sex or married life or nuclear family. We do not know except in glimpses, though, he said, the other thing which in heaven will leave simply no room for them. What that means is whatever God has for us there is gonna be even better than what we have here. And that means that whatever it's like up there, I will be even closer to my wife and closer to my kids as the family of God there than I am here, which makes me less sad. The point is Jesus asserts the radical idea that marriage is not ultimate. And that's proven by the fact that we don't take it with us in the resurrection. And that means that these relationships now that are so important, mothers and brothers or wife or father, they're only temporary. The relationships you form in the body of Christ, however, those are permanent. I love how John Piper says it. He says, Jesus was here calling out a new family <laughs> where single people in Christ, or people not in traditional families, are full-fledged family members on a par with all others bearing fruit for God and becoming mothers and fathers of the eternal kinds. Marriage is temporary and it will finally give way to the relationship to which it was pointing all along, Christ and the church. It'll be put away the way a picture is no longer needed when you see somebody face to face. When you're separated from somebody you love, you pull out their picture, you look at them. I do it when I'm on a trip and I miss my kids. I'll look and pull out a picture of them. But when I'm with them, I don't pull out pictures of them and look at them because they're standing right in front of me. He said, marriage is a picture it's a picture of a more beautiful relationship, Christ and the body of Christ and the relationships there. And when you're finally in the face-to-face -face with a person, you're not gonna need a, a silly little picture like marriage any longer. Let's go on to Paul now in 1 Corinthians 7. Here's how Paul talks about it. 
picks up on Christ's teaching and he says, the appointed time of Christ's return has grown very short. Won't we long for he's back? From now on then, let those who have wives live as though they had none. You're like, what in the world does that mean? Like, let those people with wives live like they didn't have a wife. That sounds like the mantra of people going to spend a weekend in Vegas, but that is not what Paul is saying, I can assure you, okay? Here's what he says, um, verse 30. For the present form of this world is passing away. The world is passing away, Paul says, and that means along with it, watch marriage and biological families because that's something for this world. So for a married man to live as though he had no wife means that he must reflect on the fact that his marriage now is neither permanent nor ultimate. And the flip side of that means that those of you who are single now should reflect on the fact that your situation is not permanent either. Both situations, marriage and singleness are light and momentary. Whatever your current situation might be, whether it's married or single or single again, it's important to remember that that both situations are light and momentary. And soon they're gonna give way to what is permanent and ultimate, the body of Christ. Second Corinthians reminds us that that we don't focus on what is seen. We focus on, on what is still unseen. I'd like to close our time together today with a word of prayer, helping us focus our eyes on what is eternal. Will you, will you join me? Father, your word says that, that only the Spirit can direct us to the things of the Spirit and give us these eternal eyes. So we ask you for that ability and that help right now in Jesus' name, amen. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. But the other things that marriage supplies for you, companionship and offspring, God gives you those now in ultimate form, in eternal form through the church. My point is, if God calls you to singleness, whether that is for a season or whether that is for your whole life, He will supply you with all the necessary graces to live a happy and fulfilled life in that calling. Thanks for joining us today on Summit Life. As always, you can visit us at jdgreer.com. You'll find resources, transcripts, and all of our teaching available free of charge. We'll see you next time for Summit Life with J.D. Greer. Today's program was produced and sponsored by J.D. Greer Ministries.